Hello everybody and welcome to another thunderous episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This channel is brought to you in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to help decide what topics get covered on the channel in monthly polls and get your name a special thanks at the end of each episode, you can sign up for as little as $1 per month over at patreon.com slash marymarvelite. The link is in the description below. This week's story begins with a freelance architect named Eric Masterson. Born on Long Island, Eric lived in Manhattan with his son, Kevin. But his wife, Marcy, felt that she wasn't ready for motherhood and left to pursue her career when Kevin was very young. Eric gained custody and fortunately his close friend and trusted assistant, Susan Austin, helped him raise Kevin. Another character we must introduce for this tale is Bobby Steele, the starting quarterback for the New York Smashers. After Marcy left Eric, she started dating Bobby, and the two eventually married. It was after that when Marcy finally wanted Kevin, beginning a bitter custody battle. Now, of course, this is also a Thor story, so let's quickly talk about his status during this time. By this point, he had lost the ability to physically transform into his mortal persona of Donald Blake, and instead took on a civilian identity as a construction worker named Sigurd Jarlson. And we also have a villain to kick things off with, one known as the Merciless Mongoose. While his exact origins have yet to be documented, it is now generally accepted that he is one of the New Men, a race of anthropomorphic animal people created by the mad geneticist known as the High Evolutionary. Although a high-ranking New Man named Count Tager once denied that Mongoose was truly one of them. Now, I've laid a lot of threads out on the table here, so let's start tying them together. The new man, Tager, had tasked Mongoose with collecting cell samples from the mighty Thor, who was in his civilian identity of Sigurd Jarlson, working on the same building as Eric Masterson. The Mongoose attacked, but Thor was aided by Spider-Man, allowing to preserve his secret identity. But in the ensuing battle, the building was damaged, causing several steel beams to fall. Eric Masterson pushed the foreman, Jerry Sapristi, out of the way, but was himself injured by the falling debris. Thor rushed Eric to the hospital, and while he survived, his damaged leg would require a cane. Following this, the foreman, Jerry, brought Sigurd to meet Eric, Susan, and Kevin. And after a battle with the villainous Quicksand, Eric began to suspect that Sigurd and Thor were one and the same. While Kevin Masterson began looking up to Sigurd and idolizing Thor, and Susan Austin found herself wishing that she, Eric, and Kevin could be a real family. In the meantime, Thor faced other opponents like the criminal Brute Benhurst, who had been given the enchanted blood axe of Scourge the Executioner. During that fight, Kevin tried to help Thor by striking Benhurst with his toy hammer. When Benhurst swatted the boy away, Thor realized that he wasn't the same executioner he once knew and didn't hold back in defeating him. After the battle, Thor placed an enchantment on young Kevin, binding him to wielders of weapons like Mjolnir so they would come to his aid if needed. And indeed, Kevin would unknowingly use this enchantment to summon the Thunder God to rescue his father. You see, sometime later, the Mongoose returned and abducted Eric in another attempt to lure out Thor. Eric was brought back to Mount Wundagor in Transia, where he learned about the High Evolutionary and the New Men. In his previous attempts to forcefully elevate humanity with a genetic bomb, the High Evolutionary was confronted by a group of Avengers, including the Olympian demigod Hercules. That battle, and the so-called Evolutionary War, ended when both Hercules and the High Evolutionary were forcefully evolved beyond a state of godhood. In practical terms, what that really means is that they both transcended their physical forms and disappeared. However, Tagar had tracked both of their essences to an enigmatic section of space called the Black Galaxy. And so when Thor arrived to rescue Eric, Tagar convinced him to journey there and retrieve them. Thor agreed, since Hercules was a close friend and several Knights of Wundagore, new men who had been trained in combat, volunteered to join him. 
Eric was distrusting of the whole situation, and so he came along as well, wearing a robotic battle armor provided by the new men. Thor donned his own godly armor for the quest, and decided to abandon using mortal guises to hide his identity. Sure enough, within the Black Galaxy, Thor, Eric, and the Knights of Wendigore found the souls of both Hercules and the High Evolutionary, who had ascended to a higher form of godhood. But they also discovered that the entire area was a kind of living bioverse, which had also caught the attention of the cosmic space gods known as the Celestials. We've talked about them several times on the channel, but of the myriad types of beings to be described as gods, the Celestials are far more powerful than most. As a part of their experiments in the Black Galaxy, Hercules and the High Evolutionary were returned to physical form. And for reasons that neither god nor mortal could fathom at the time, they were allowed to return to Earth. However, after that, Thor was attacked again by the Mongoose, who at this point just wanted revenge for his previous defeats. When the villain gained the upper hand, Eric jumped in to help Thor and even lifted his enchanted hammer. But the Mongoose struck Eric, mortally wounding him before escaping again. Thor prayed to his father to save Eric's life, which Odin did by joining Thor and Eric into one being. Like he had done with his previous mortal guises, the two could transform back and forth by striking the hammer Mjolnir against the ground, which would then be disguised as a simple walking cane. After that, Hercules became Eric's roommate for a while under the pseudonym Harry Cleese. Thor continued to face various villains during this time, with Hercules sometimes aiding him. He battled the Juggernaut during the Acts of Vengeance conspiracy, and encountered the new warriors when they made their public debut. Eric, meanwhile, began to become romantically involved with a fellow architect named Jackie Lucas. This resulted in some jealousy from Susan, who cared deeply for both Eric and Kevin. Not only that, but Eric's ex-wife Marcy continued to push for custody of their son since she'd gotten remarried. Eric's absences while fighting as Thor made this even harder and strained his relationships and career. Now, we aren't finished with the Celestials or the Black Galaxy today because during his time sharing his existence with Eric, Thor was visited by a being called the Replicoid, a servant of the space gods created to look like Thor. He was ordered to return with Hercules to the Black Galaxy, but before it could explain why, the Replicoid was destroyed by Stellaris, a self-proclaimed Celestial Slayer. She was an alien who swore vengeance on the space gods after they destroyed her home planet. After a battle with Stellaris, Eric realized that he couldn't offer Kevin the stability he needed while he shared his existence with Thor, and relinquished custody to his ex-wife. Kevin wasn't totally ignorant of what was happening, however, and he knew that his father was in some way helping Thor and Hercules, and that he needed to leave for a while. Returning to the Black Galaxy, Thor again encountered the High Evolutionary, who wished to study the Celestials, and Stellaris, who wanted to destroy them. It was soon discovered that the Space Gods were using the Black Galaxy's Bioverse to spawn a new Celestial. Furthermore, it seems that they intended on using Hercules in the process, and had only summoned Thor to get him. They also struck Thor with an energy bolt that separated him and Eric once again. And despite him only being mortal, or perhaps because he was, they also took Eric Masterson. When the new Celestial was nearly complete, Stellaris attempted to destroy it by detonating her living armor. However, this backfired and instead provided the energy necessary to bring it to life. The living bioverse of the Black Galaxy was absorbed into its massive form, completing the birth of a new space god. Hercules and Eric were then returned to Thor, presumably because they were no longer needed. But shortly after that, the three were summoned to Asgard, where the frost giant Ymir was locked in combat with the fire demon Surtur. Thor tried to stop the resulting devastation, but was knocked down and buried in ice. Eric attempted to lift Mjolnir once again, but this time the hammer refused to move. 
Suspecting that he and Thor were now incomplete without one another, Eric reached out and grabbed Thor's hand while still holding on to his hammer. The two merged together again and banished the two giants into the Sea of Eternal Night. Eric returned to Earth where Susan Austin and Jerry Sapristi claimed to know his secret. But it turns out they'd suspected that Eric's problems and absences were because he'd started drinking. Fortunately, Marcy still cared about Eric and had no intent on stopping him from visiting their son. He also reunited with fellow architect Jackie Lucas and the two teased a budding romance. However, sometime later, Thor's scheming brother Loki kidnapped young Kevin Masterson. Well, technically he was kidnapped by Amora the Enchantress and Ulick the Troll, who took him from Susan and turned him over to Loki. This was of course to lure his brother into a trap, but Thor succeeded in rescuing Kevin. He was also aided in this battle by the special NYPD unit Code Blue. Meanwhile, the Enchantress compelled Susan to lead Mercy and Jackie to Kevin. As they arrived, Code Blue reunited Kevin with his mother. But Loki then attempted to fire a blast of energy at both Mercy and Kevin. Again compelled by Amora, who was trying to hide her own role in Kevin's capture, Susan pushed Mercy out of the way and was badly injured when struck by Loki's attack. Enraged, Thor used a forbidden enchantment to remove Loki's divine life force, killing his immortal enemy. However, even this was part of Loki's schemes as he had already made a deal with the super demon Mephisto. At the moment of his death, Loki's soul inhabited the body of his father Odin, while Odin's spirit was banished to Mephisto's hell. Posing as his own father, Loki demanded that Thor be punished for taking an immortal life. And so Thor's spirit was banished to the deepest recesses of Eric's subconscious, so that he could no longer even feel him inside of him. Upon trying to transform, he found that his body changed to resemble a bearded Thor, but his mind remained that of Eric Masterson. Donning a masked helmet, Eric continued to operate as Thor and assumed his responsibilities. He took the Thunder God's place on the Mighty Avengers with only Captain America knowing his true identity. Not knowing what had happened to the real Thor, Eric traveled to Asgard looking for answers, but left empty-handed. But he did help defend the Golden Realm from Annihilus, the living death that walks. Eric was subsequently among the heroes who assembled to combat Thanos during the first crisis surrounding the Infinity Gauntlet, a cosmic battle at the edge of the universe. During this conflict, he was transformed into glass and shattered, but was later restored when Thanos was defeated and the damage he caused was undone. And although he had complete control over both his mortal and Thor forms, Eric's double life often left his would-be love interest, Jackie, confused and frustrated. Things on that front were made worse by the Enchantress who took the identity, Lena Moran, in an attempt to get close to Eric. Meanwhile, the foes he'd face during this time included the supervillain power couple, the Absorbing Man, and Titania. Seeing the love they had for one another, Eric couldn't help but develop a begrudging respect. Rather than take them into custody, he decided to leave them alone as long as they quit their life of crime. It was also around this time that he finally met Mercy's new husband, Bobby, and learned that Bobby wanted to adopt Kevin. Eric didn't take the news well, but in human form, his punch had little effect on the star quarterback. Another enemy he encountered during this time was a time-traveling villain named Zarko the Tomorrow Man. Zarko tricked Dargo Kator, who wielded Mjolnir in the 26th century, into attacking Eric. However, their fight was interrupted by another hammer wielder, Beta Ray Bill. Joining forces, the assembled Thor Corps defeated Zarko and thwarted his plan to collapse every timeline into one. After that, the Hell Lord Mephisto succeeded in stealing Thor's hammer while it was in the form of a walking cane. But with magical protections from Doctor Strange and backup from the Silver Surfer, Eric was able to infiltrate the demon's realm and regain his weapon and power. 
Both he and the Surfer were pulled out of hell by Doctor Strange, but Eric was tricked into believing that Mephisto had Thor's soul. Unable to return to hell, Eric soon found that he'd been evicted from his apartment and his business had failed due to his constant absence. He subsequently moved into Avengers Mansion and participated in the events of Operation Galactic Storm, when the Earth intervened in the Kree-Shi'ar War. He also fought in the Infinity War, in which Adam Warlock's evil counterpart, the Magus, made his own play for ultimate power by obtaining the Infinity Gauntlet. Eric's exploits as Thor and a member of the Avengers are too numerous to explore them all in detail, but as you can see, he was involved in many key conflicts during this time. He also battled a fuzzy green villain called the Grunk, who seemingly tried to steal Christmas. But he turned out to be more of a misunderstood monster who wanted to bring presents to the homeless people he lived with underground. Meanwhile, Amora, the Enchantress, summoned the Executioner's Enchanted Battle Axe, intending on aiding fellow Asgardian Heimdall against the treachery of the Norn Queen Carnilla. The details of that conflict aren't too important for this story, but the relevant thing is that Amora was attacked and dropped the weapon. The Blood Axe was then picked up by someone else, but we'll keep that person's identity a secret for the moment. If you don't already know the answer, place your guess in the comments below and all will be revealed by the end of the video. Initially, this person transformed and manifested the armor of the Executioner, but soon created a new look for themselves, becoming the lethal vigilante Blood Axe. At the same time, Thor's lifelong friends, Sif and Balder, were searching for the whereabouts of the true Thor. Of course, this quest eventually brought them back to Earth and to Eric. From him, they learned of Mephisto's potential involvement in holding Thor's soul. Wasting no time, Sif rushed through a dimensional portal to Hell. However, Eric and Balder were delayed by an encounter with Bloodaxe, who had been slaughtering gang members and attacking the police. Bloodaxe defeated Eric, but escaped before Balder entered the fray. The crazed vigilante changed back to human form and began to suspect the truth that the axe itself was taking control. After that, Eric and Balder traveled to Hell and fought with a corrupted Sif. Fortunately, Eric was able to help her come to her senses by changing back to mortal form. Sif continued to attack but regained control of herself before killing him. As Eric comforted Sif, the two shared a close embrace and a brief kiss. Uh, they then learned that it wasn't Thor's soul who Mephisto held captive, but Odin's, which he freely turned over. Returning to Asgard, Eric battled Loki, who was still in Odin's body. Sif then freed Odin's spirit from the soul shroud, allowing him to reclaim his form. She then captured Loki's disembodied essence in the same bag, turning it over to the Hell Lord as repayment, thus giving the devil his due. Odin then revealed the truth that Thor was still inside Eric, leaving the mortal to ponder if he was truly worthy or if was simply Thor the entire time. Meanwhile, Bloodaxe witnessed Doctor Strange in astral form and mistakenly believed him to be a threat. When Susan Austin, having recovered from her injuries, investigated the subsequent commotion, Bloodaxe misguidedly abducted her. So if you guessed that Susan was Bloodaxe, nope, that's not the answer, although Bloodaxe did know her name. Anyway, the vigilante then battled Code Blue and another team, Earth Force, before being banished to another dimension by Doctor Strange. As for Eric, he began a psychic trial known as the Gauntlet of the Grim Guardian. Delving into his own subconscious, Eric saw his childhood home and a manifestation of his younger self. He also faced his fears, first in the form of various villains he'd encountered as Thor. He also endured a vision of the various women in his life, pulling him in different directions. Finally, he came face to face with the titular Grim Guardian himself. Destroying his helmet, Eric found this being to be yet another manifestation of one piece of himself. Then, after conquering his fears, doubts, and rage, Eric Masterson found the essence of Thor sealed deep within his mind. Freed by his friend, Thor returned in physical form, once again separate from any mortal host. 
He then passed his hammer to Eric, who found that even without Thor inside of him, he was able to change to godly form and wield his power. Allowing Eric to keep the hammer, Thor decided to stay in Asgard with Sif so he could fulfill his obligations there while Eric defended the Earth. And of course, Eric did indeed return to his homeworld and reunite it with Susan, Mercy, and Kevin. Since Eric's career had tanked, his former assistant began working for his ex-wife. After that, the Enchantress manipulated Eric and Thor into fighting one another. While they came to their senses, Eric decided to relinquish the hammer to its proper owner. However, Thor presented his friend with a gift, a new walking stick. Eric noticed the cane looked strikingly like the one Mjolnir changed into and tried hitting it on the ground. Sure enough, Eric once again transformed as the cane was actually a new weapon, an enchanted mace that Odin had forged for him. And inscribed on the side of this weapon were the words, The world still needs heroes. Thunderstrike. And so when Bloodaxe eventually returned to continue their brutal vigilantism, Eric donned a new costume and took the name Thunderstrike to combat them. He successfully disarmed his foe and claimed their enchanted weapon, but Bloodaxe escaped before reverting to mortal form. From there, Eric had a respectable superhero career under the name Thunderstrike, so we won't be delving into every adventure he went on in this video. Initially, it wasn't easy, however, as the Blood Axe had a corrupting influence on him and haunted his dreams. At the same time, the alien Stellaris took an interest in Thunderstrike and began helping him. Meanwhile, Mercy's new husband Bobby started to grow unstable due to his failing career and use of steroids. Things came to a head there when it seemed as though Bobby was going to hurt Kevin. As Thunderstrike, Eric intervened and threatened him with violence. However, Bobby claimed that he wouldn't hurt the boy and Kevin believed him, insisting that Bobby needed help. The troubled man was faced with his faults and agreed to confront his addiction. He even attended a party thrown by Eric and his new roommate, Samantha Joyce, seeking reconciliation. It was at that same party where a certain person found and reclaimed the Executioner's Axe. Not only did Blood Axe return, but they learned that Eric Masterson was Thunderstrike. Furthermore, Eric realized that Blood Axe was someone he'd invited into his own home. In another adventure, Thunderstrike encountered an imposter Thor who wore the same costume he did when he was in the role. Eric defeated him and exposed him as a fraud by wearing armor belonging to the real Thor. Speaking of whom, after that, the two of them reunited and spent several hours reconnecting as friends. Following this, Bobby Steele was traded to a team in Los Angeles and planned to move there with Mercy and Kevin. Mercy suggested he instead retire so Kevin could stay close to his father, but Bobby refused. To his credit, he did try to find a way to cancel the trade, but his only options were to accept it or quit. Meanwhile, Stellaris took the alias Leah Princess and moved in with Eric and his roommate Samantha Joyce. During a team up with Luke Cage, Thunderstrike faced off against a group of villains which included the mysterious Mongoose. Eric was initially stricken with fear in the face of his old foe, but was able to summon his courage and pull through. Thunderstrike's superhero career continued as he fought alongside the likes of She-Hulk, Black Panther, War Machine, and more. In another adventure, he actually teamed up with Blood Axe when the vigilante sought his help against the evil Egyptian god Seth. The would-be heroes were met with defeat during that conflict, and while they both escaped, Eric was branded with a mark that supposedly ensured his death was in the near future. And so sometime after that, he revealed his dual identity to his son, Kevin. He made peace with Bobby, and when the football player offered to let him throw another punch, Eric instead shook his hand. He actually got together with Jackie Lucas, and Stellaris returned to space. Finally, a mystery that had been plaguing him came to light when he next encountered Mongoose and stopped Bloodaxe from killing him. In the ensuing battle, Eric was able to separate Blood Axe from their enchanted weapon for 60 seconds, long enough for them to revert back to mortal form. 
As it turns out, Blood Axe was none other than Jackie Lucas the entire time. Taking the axe, Eric hoped to claim enough power to kill Seth, but was quickly corrupted himself. He succeeded in his task, destroying the god's physical body and casting his spirit into space. But because of his corruption, he was soon confronted by the Avengers. Even Thor arrived to help, and Eric begged his friend to stop him. But it was Eric who had to stop himself as he looked into his own mind and spoke with the spirit of Scourge the Executioner, the Asgardian god who first wielded the Blood Axe. Regaining control of himself, he took the full power of his enchanted mace and turned it against the axe. He succeeded in purging himself of the weapon's evil, but at the cost of his own life. When Thunderstrike awakened, he and Scourge were in Valhalla, the land of the honored dead. But Eric chose not to remain there, and instead passed on to a human afterlife. His grave was visited by his family and loved ones, including Mercy, Kevin, and Jackie. Kevin would never forget his father, but accepted Bobby as his new dad. As for Thor, he paid his respects by etching a message into Eric's tombstone with lightning. The world still needs heroes. And indeed, it would continue to. Years later, the enchanted mace would be lifted by another when a teenage Kevin Masterson succeeded his father to become the new Thunderstrike. But that's a story for another time. If you want to read it for yourself, you can check out the five-issue Thunderstrike series from 2010 to 2011. And that's all I've got for you this week, but thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, share the video, and subscribe for more Marvelous content. Be sure to leave a comment letting me know what Marvel hero or villain you want to hear about next, and as always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page, where for only a dollar a month you can get your name in these special thanks here. And my Twitch channel, where I play games at 2.30 Eastern Time every Saturday and Sunday. So until next time, true believers, Excelsior!